Welcome to The Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education in plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Morgan Martin, and welcome back to The Loop Podcast. Today's episode is a resident-guided in-service review of skin, bone, and cartilage grafts. This is a supplementary episode and not meant to be a comprehensive review. So this is a breakdown of the key points from the previous examinations over the past five years. And this may help if you're studying for boards or for the in-service exam. And don't forget, if you want to see illustrations with our podcast, you can watch this on our YouTube channel. Yeah, so that is Dr. Sanam Zahidi, and she is here with me today to discuss this very exciting topic. All right, so let's get started with skin, bone, and cartilage grafts. Let's get to it. All right, so for wounds, remember debridement prior to reconstruction is very important and is always your first step. Debridement involves the removal of non-viable or contaminated tissue that impedes normal tissue growth. It renews the wound and surrounding tissue to promote normal healing by removing infection, biofilm, and senescent cells. Now moving on to sweat glands, we're going to talk about two specific glands in particular, apocrine glands and eccrine glands. Apocrine glands are responsible for sweat production and when mixed with bacteria produce body odor, which can be malodorous. Apocrine glands are located in hair-bearing areas such as the axilla and groin, and they secrete watery fluid that is higher in protein. Eccrine glands are located throughout the body and secrete primarily water and salt. So let's talk about skin grafting. So we already did a burn lecture, so we won't get into all the details of skin grafting for burns, but here are a few key points from this section. The principle of skin grafting dictates that first, a clean wound must be obtained. This is achieved through operative debridement and washout to remove all necrotic eschar and eliminate any possible source of bacteria or infection. Next, mixed grafts have better survival as this prevents seroma or hematoma from accumulating and preventing adherence of the graft. And a bolster dressing is placed for five days to prevent shearing of the graft and improve graft survival rates. Yes, and another key point is the donor site where you harvest your skin graft. This is re-epithelialized by multipotent stem cells that are found within the hair follicles. Now, another important thing for us to talk about, and they love to ask the mechanism of skin graft survival. And it's also a very favorite pimp question on rounds. So for skin graft survival, the immediate method is through serum imbibition, which means the graft passively absorbs nutrients from the underlying serum by diffusion during the first 48 hours. So the next is revascularization and inosculation. Revascularization refers to direct ingrowth of new blood vessels into the graft from the underlying wound bed. And then inosculation describes a process by which blood vessels from the underlying wound bed connect with existing vessels in the skin graft. And it takes four to five days for the graft to become vascularized. Another heavily tested area on the exam is with regard to contraction of skin grafts. So we're going to go through primary and secondary contraction. Primary contraction of a skin graft occurs immediately, and it's related to elastin fibers in the dermis, which explains why full thickness skin grafts have more primary contracture compared to split thickness skin grafts. They have more dermis, so they contract more primarily. Now, on the other hand, secondary contraction is contraction after the graft heals completely, and it's related to myofibroblast activity. So it's higher in split thickness skin grafts. And last point, split thickness skin grafts have less metabolic demand, and therefore they should be used in situations where you're concerned about healing of the graft. Yes. And so now moving on to fat grafting. So the most common complication of fat injection remains the resorption of the fat that is grafted. And it is between 50 and 80%. And this was determined through volumetric analysis of fat grafted to the breast. The only thing proven to increase adipocyte viability and then therefore increase take of the fat graft is to decrease time between harvest and injection. The longer at room temperature, the fewer the fat cells, possibly no fat cell viability after four hours at room temperature. Other suggestions include an atraumatic harvest and placement of the graft in multiple small aliquots, which increases the availability of vascularity. So Morgan, basically what you're saying is you don't want to just put a big blob of fat somewhere, right? Because you don't want to get necrosis on that fat. You want to put tiny little aliquots. Yes, that is very true. The smaller the aliquot, the better. 
You can also get an infection after fat grafting, and this includes MRSA in the immediate time period, and then mycobacterium in a delayed fashion. And so this would include cellulitis, abscess, low-grade fever. However, it would have a negative gram stain, and the patient is usually not systemically ill. Another complication to be aware of is blindness or stroke. And this has been reported when done in the face because of the ophthalmic artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid artery, and fat can be embolized to the brain. So something to keep in mind. Moving on to cartilage grafts, the most common complication is the propensity to change shape or warp over time. It's decreased by removing the perichondrium, so you should attempt harvest in the subperichondrial plane. Ideally, you should wait 30 minutes after harvest to use it, and the ideal autograft is from the septum, concha, or our rib. These grafts have very low risk for infection or extrusion compared to an allograft, but as you can imagine, the rib is probably going to be the one that hurts the most. Before we talk about biologic dressings, let's quickly mention a common theme. So adequate debridement, including clearance of any polymicrobial infection, is one of the keys to successful reconstruction using these biologic materials. And this is frequently tested, such as the most likely reason for failure. Moving on to biologic dressings that we commonly use on a day-to-day basis. Apple graft or an or cell, they're permanent bilayers of bovine collagen and human keratinocytes from cultured foreskin, not for full thickness defects with exposed structures, and the living cells in the graft stimulate growth factors and matrix proteins, and that's tested. Next is graphics, which is cryopreserved human placental membrane and contains extracellular matrix, progenitor cells, and growth factors. This can be used on diabetic foot ulcers, burns, venous ulcers, and traumatic wounds. The next is Epifix. It's composed of human amnion and chorion, and it's a single layer of epithelial cells. There's a basement membrane and an avascular connective tissue matrix that supplies the extracellular matrix. It's also used for diabetic foot ulcers, burns, venous ulcers, and traumatic wounds. Next is Alginate. So this is seaweed, and it is good for exudative wounds. And we all know silver kills bacteria. And then Integra, very popular. So Integra is a bilaminate neodermis artificial skin substitute. It is composed of a cross-linked bovine tendon collagen glycosaminoglycan or chondroitin 6-sulfate matrix coated on one side with a synthetic polysiloxane polymer or silicone layer. The silicone layer acts like an epidermis to avoid moisture loss and the underlying collagen a scaffold for ingrowth. So this allows for a thinner autograft, so using a split thickness skin graft on the hand instead of a full thickness skin graft would be an example if you're able to use Integra underneath. And the indications are to use on top of bone without periosteum, on top of tendon without peritinon, or on top of cartilage without perichondrium. And you can graft on top of Integra after four weeks. And if we still have your attention, then we're going to move on to the next one, which is BioBrain. (laughs) So it's a type 1 bovine collagen. There's two layers, inner of nylon and collagen, and the outer is a silicone layer. It's similar to porcine. It promotes granulation underneath, and then it's removed. It's used temporarily to prevent evaporative losses until a permanent skin graft can be placed. Think of it like a xenograft for burn wounds. And it also allows epithelialization underneath it. All right, now dermographs. So this is a dermal cellular matrix with foreskin fibroblasts. It stimulates healing by stimulated fibrovascular tissue and epithelialization. This can be used for full thickness diabetic foot ulcers without exposed structures. And of course, all of us know alloderm, right? But I'm going to give you some, hopefully, knowledge that you don't know about. I'm just kidding. You probably already know this too. (laughs) It's a human cryopreserved acellular neodermis. And it allows fibroblasts to infiltrate and integrate and cause revascularization, which is why it can be used in an infected field. And we all love using this with breast reconstruction. Other dressings include WinVac. So this increases the take of dermal regeneration matrix such as Integra. No way. Yes way. (laughs) All right. So now let's move on to talking about bones and bone graft. There are two types of bones, including first long bones. So you have a diaphysis, a metaphysis, and epiphysis. So the diaphysis is the shaft, has a hollow middle with cortical bone. The metaphysis is the flared ends, and the epiphysis is near the articular surface. Then we have flat bones, and these are mainly cancellous bone with thin cortical shells. 
Moving on to talking about their blood supply. So the intramedullary canal artery supplies the diaphysis. There's periosteal blood supply that goes for the outer one-third of the cortex. And then flat bones have nutrient artery and periosteal supply. All right, let's talk about the bone cells. So osteoblasts, these are stem cells of bone with ability to differentiate into osteocytes. They remain quiescent or return to osteoprogenitor cells or de-differentiated bone cells, and they form the organic bone matrix or build bone. So you can remember this as blast build bone, osteoblast build bone. Osteocytes, so these are osteoblasts that have surrounded themselves with organic matrix and they live in lacunae and they maintain calcium homeostasis. Osteoclasts are large multinucleated cells that break down bone. Now moving on to bone matrix, there's inorganic and organic. With inorganic, it's composed of hydroxyapatite crystals which give bone its strength. It is the body's store of calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and sodium. With organic bone matrix, it's formed by the osteoblast. It contains 90% of your type 1 collagen and bone morphogenic protein, which has osteoinductive properties. All right, now, so for bone formation, first you have endochondral ossification. So this is when it goes through cartilaginous matrix first before ossification. The primary method for long bone formation, longitudinal growth at the physial plate and fracture healing. And this is endochondral ossification. You then have intramembranous ossification. So this is spontaneous bone formation without a cartilage intermediate. It is the method of formation for destruction, osteogenesis, and fracture healing. So that's really important. So for destruction, osteogenesis, it's intramembranous ossification. Since we're talking about fracture healing, let's mention primary versus secondary fracture healing. With primary, it's through reduction and rigid fixation with minimal gap. That doesn't form a callus. It's actually very rare for you to have primary fixation. Now with secondary fixation, it occurs through endochondral and intramembranous ossification, like Morgan just said, with callus. And it's enhanced by callus formation. And your stages in terms of the fracture healing goes from hematoma inflammatory phase, to angiogenesis, to cartilage production, to bone formation, to remodeling. And then the remodeling, just like any remodeling anywhere else, right? It gives strength and it occurs by three weeks. All right. So now we're going to talk about destruction osteogenesis. So with destruction osteogenesis, so this generates vascularized bone with normal cortical and medullary features. And so there are five zones and then three phases. So the first zone is the central zone where you will see cellular proliferation. Zone two is the transitional zone of vasculogenesis. You then have number three, a paracentral zone. And here you will find parallel orientation of collagen fibers with osteoid production. You then have a fourth transitional mineralization front, and this is the primary mineralization found with bone spiculae formation. And then the fifth and final zone is the mature bone zone. Here you have progressive calcification of primary mineralization front with formation of cortical and cancellous elements. You also need to know about three phases. The first phase is the latency phase. And so this is the period between when you're in the OR and you make your osteotomy and then the commencement of distraction. So in neonates, say when you do this for mandibular distraction for Pierre Robin, so this can be very short, like zero to 72 hours. But in adults, most patients, you're going to wait about five to seven days before you begin distraction. So the second phase is then the activation phase. And this is the period of active distraction and produces what is called the generant. You then have the third phase, which is the consolidation phase. And this begins when the desired length of distraction has been achieved and the activation ends. Now, moving on to our final topic, which is about bone grafts. Osteogenesis requires both osteoconduction with osteoinductive factors. So osteoconduction, that means creeping substitution. Once implanted, it serves as a non-viable scaffold for new progenitor cells and blood vessels. The bone graft becomes a template 
for the deposition of new bone and the graft reabsorbs. So examples of this are cortical bone, and you can have split calvarial bone or iliac crest. And this revascularizes in two months. For split calvarial, you can only use this after age four when the diploic space is formed. And some people even say after age nine, so at least after age four. So another example would be hydroxyapatite. So this is the principal inorganic mineral of the bone. And keep in mind this also osteointegrates. It is resistant to resorption. Another example would be porous polyethylene or medpor. This has no osteointegration. And then the last example would be cancellous bone. And this has greater osteoconduction than cortical, but the primary way it heals is osteoinduction. It has less strength than cortical bone graft, and it takes several months. Moving on to osteointegration, it refers to a connection between ordered living bone and the surface of a load-carrying implant without an intervening layer of fibrous tissue. So you have two of them. There's titanium and hydroxyapatite. With titanium, you have no osteoconduction, but with hydroxyapatite, you also have osteoconduction. So this is actually really important. The titanium has osteointegration, but no osteoconduction. And hydroxyapatite, on the other hand, has both osteointegration and osteoconduction. Yes, this is really confusing. So that's why we're going through all this in such detail. So next is osteoinduction. So osteoinduction refers to the direct stimulation of mesenchymal cells at the recipient site by bone morphogenic protein to differentiate into osteoprogenitor cells. So think of this as demineralized bone putty, also bone morphogenic protein or BMP. So BMP is only osteoinductive. It needs a carrier for conduction. And keep in mind, this is not approved for kids younger than 12 years of age. So next, cancellous bone. This is the primary way, but it has no strength for three months. Also, kids less than four years of age with large cranial defects, cranial particular bone, so not the same as bone dust, you can use this and it is the same donor site field and offers better strength and resorption is excellent. Moving on to osteogenesis. It's the formation of new bone by cells in a flap or graft that survive the transfer. This is the primary mechanism by which a vascularized bone graft heals. So whenever you think osteogenesis, think of free fibula graft. This graft has the ability to synthesize new bone, and it has highest bone-forming potential. Osteoblasts in the donor survive the transplant and quickly start producing new bone. Cancelin bone does both osteogenesis, osteoinduction, and osteoconduction versus vascularized bone graft does osteogenesis but no osteoinduction or conduction. Other materials that we need to mention are methyl methacrylate. This has a highly exothermic reaction which can actually damage surrounding tissue and the material can warp. There's also difficulty shaping after polymerization. There can also be infection and plate fracture. So there are a lot of negatives to the methyl methacrylate. Another negative is it does not have osseointegration. And moving on to just make a quick note about the location for where you would want to take your bone graft from. For ribs, ribs 5 through 7 are the best option. And this is because of easy access. And if you think about it, if you use rib 7, you're over the abdominal cavity. So you have decreased risks of pneumothorax. And then for women, if you use, for example, rib 5 or 6, it'll be around there. You can hide the scar underneath their IMS. That's a really good point. And so another location for a bone graft, the lateral tibial tubercle or Gerdes tubercle. So this is proximal and medial to the tibialis anterior. So this has been a question in the past. So where do you make the cortical window? And again, it's proximal and medial to the tibialis anterior. Okay, so now let's do a really quick rapid fire of the bone grafts because this is actually really confusing. So let's start with osteoconduction. So that's creeping substitution. So think of all the C's, conduction, creeping. And I'm also going to talk about like an orchestra conductor. Just think of the bone graft as like a template and it's acting like an orchestra conductor for deposition of new bone and the graft to get reabsorbed. Yeah, I'm going to remember conduction creeping. So the C, conduction creeping. All right, what about osseointegration? That's where you're actually integrating the implant with the bone itself. 
And you have a great example for this. Morgan, I want you to tell them. Yeah, so osteo integration, you just have to remember that with bionic arms, there is a way to use an osteo integrated titanium implant. So if you've ever seen the really cool YouTube videos, you can go and take a look at this and you'll never forget osteo integration. Now, what about osteoinduction? So now you're inducing or stimulating the mesenchymal cells at the recipient site to differentiate into osteoprogenitor cells. So basically, you're inducing or causing bone formation. All right. And I'll just say for the very last one, osteogenesis is the formation of new bone by cells that have survived when you have a vascularized bone graft. So you're making new bone from living bone cells. Okay, everyone, that was a quick and maybe not so easy, but at least fast overview of what you're likely to see on the in-service exam related to skin, cartilage, and bone graft. Thanks, Morgan, for joining. All right, everyone, that was a great review. Thanks, Sanam. And I just want to let everyone know that we are all on the Clubhouse app now, and we are hosting some really fun weekly discussions about all things plastic surgery, especially education. And those are very helpful and resourceful. So make sure and follow us to get those updates. And if you like our podcast, make sure and spread the word. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And our handle is at the Loop Podcast. So follow us to get in the loop.